Welcome everybody from Facebook and welcome everybody into this session um, to pick Michael Lowenstern's brain. So I know you all have many, many questions um, that are just burning inside and you want to get answered and I hope you have them ready. So please um, use the Q&A function on Zoom here if you can. If not, just go ahead and type it in the chat and then on Facebook if you're joining us, type the questions there in the chat and Jenny and I will We'll uh, provide them here as we have time. So I'm um, really looking forward to this. So thank you, Michael, for being here. Um, and I apologize in advance. I don't know how weird this might get with questions, but oh, you know, I mean, I, <laughs> I am uh, I'm the king of radical transparency, you know, uh, which is otherwise known as TMI. So um, <laughs> it's all good. Okay. So Jenny, you had some questions submitted to you. Do um, you want to start with those? Yeah, before we get to those, actually, um, Mike, why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, Tell us who you are, what you do, um, and okay. maybe start off with that, and then I'll get the questions ready. I'm Michael Owenstern. Um, I am a, a dad. I'm a bass clarinet player. I have a YouTube channel. Um, I have a day job working as the creative director for Amazon, uh, and I've done that for a bunch of years. I work in advertising, um, so that's how... That's how I'm able to split my life uh, and do what I enjoy and be able to put food on the table. So uh, happy to talk about anything related to sort of living living a double major life, as my wife calls it, a double major. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's me. And I'm a dad. I'm a pilot. That's the wheel of my plane right there. Maybe first, I'll start with one of my personal questions before we get to the list I have. Um, tell us about being a pilot. I think I first found that out when it was Clarinet Fest several years ago in Kansas or something, I want to say. And like that's when I realized not only did you do everything Clarinet related in Amazon, but you were a pilot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I um, I always wanted to, to learn how to fly a plane. I mean, I've always been into, you know, different kinds of vehicles. I'm not into boats, but um, when I was a little kid, I used to ride around on my bicycle making motorcycle noises out of my mouth, like, you know, and uh, I was Michael Michael Motor. I've always Michael Michael Motorcycle. That's what they called me um, in the alley in Chicago where I grew up. But I've always loved vehicles and I've always wanted to learn how to fly. And, you know, I saved up my pennies and I learned how to fly and I saved up a few more and I bought a plane. And now I fly all over the place. I don't I mean, I fly commercial when I have to fly far but uh, I fly myself when I don't. Okay. It's much better that way. <laughs> so the first musical question, and I think this one is going to relate with a lot of people watching this. Um, how do you deal with musical burnout? Um, well, I don't know. I'm in a, I have sort of a luxury of, of, if I feel like I don't want to do it, I don't do it because I don't do it for a living. I do it because I love it. Uh, I think the closest thing I get to burnout though, is whenever I feel an obligation to do something that I don't want to do and I still have to do it. And I think that they'll, you know, sometimes that happens with the YouTube channel because I, I have to, I've committed for the last 10 years to doing a video every two weeks, except in the summer and, you know, coming up with, I think I'm up over 250 videos. You kind of run out of things to say, but you still have to make videos and you, you know, it's boring to repeat yourself. So how I deal with that is I just, uh, I do it. I set aside time for it. I know I'm going to do it. It feels like a chore sometimes. Um, usually it doesn't end up feeling like a chore. I usually get into it and have fun. Uh, but I just, I push myself. Um, I'm writing a record, right? I'm doing another well, record. What is that now? Um, I'm making another recording uh, for the first time in six years. And I, I hadn't written music in a long time. I was beating myself up because, you know, I'm, I'm, I like to write. I sort of part of my identity. I enjoy composing. I enjoy performing. And um, this, you know, COVID gave me a bunch of extra hours in my day, as it has all of us. And I forced myself to just sit down and write every day. So how do I deal with burnout? Uh, if I can, I watch TV or play video games, and if I can't, I force myself to do it. But but generally speaking, you got to find a way to uh, that to be able to express yourself. You have to if you if you feel like performing, if you feel like doing something else, you have to do the parts of music you love, and uh, and then it stops feeling like so much of a chore. Hopefully. And before we go on to the next music question, um, we're dying to know what kind of plane it is. <laughs> Oh, I have a, a 1973 Piper Arrow. Yeah, so the plane is is coming up on 50 years old. <laughs> 
and it still stays in the sky. It's amazing. Have you ever, before we get, I have some questions on my own too. Have you ever thought about doing a YouTube video, maybe like piloting and like playing clarinet, combining some of your interests? I did that. I did that. Uh, I made a, I, I made a recording of, yeah, no, no, no. That was, it, it's one where I, I did a 360 VR video of me doing Michael Jackson. Uh, and there's a section of that where it's in the plane and you, you can actually control the camera and look around and I'm flying over the Statue of Liberty and that sort of thing. So that, but playing while you're flying could get dangerous. No, not that. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't do that. It's like playing while you're um, driving your car. That would be a problem. Right. Um, I'll try and find that video and link it in the chat below or maybe Jessica can do that. Um, the next question, do you have any tips for switching from soprano to bass, bass to contra, switching between the different clarinets? That's a really good question. And there's that's a video that um, I'm, I'm going to make. Uh, switching between clarinets is um, is a challenge, obviously, uh, not just sort of the equipment challenge, right? Like you want to have a good read, you need to have, you know, when you have one good read, you're happy, but then you have to have like a bunch because then you're switching. Um, so, but generally I play the same kind of setup on clarinet as I do on bass. I play pretty open mouthpiece on uh, on the clarinet and, and a fairly light read, same thing on the bass clarinet, same thing on the saxophone um, and, and really, if, if you've got like a really, um, like on your B-flat clarinet, if you're playing like a BD and it's very resistant, and then you go to the bass clarinet, you're playing like a B-50, uh, and it's like, oh, it, you can't do that. So you really need to have a similar setup for both instruments. Okay, and Rick wants to know, did you start off playing the bass clarinet? And if not, at now, um, what point did you switch and why? Okay, so... Um, I tell people I started on the bass because in here I started on the bass. You know how sometimes you're like, well, how'd you choose the clarinet? You know, the instrument sort of chooses you. I don't know if any of you know what I mean. Um, I started playing the B flat clarinet, the regular clarinet, the regular clarinet uh, in, uh, when I was eight in the fourth grade uh, in Chicago. That's when they started us in music at the school I was in. And uh, I played the instrument that my mother played in high school, which also my sister played in high school. And I, Damn it, I was gonna play it. They weren't just gonna buy me an instrument that I was gonna quit. No, you're gonna play the clarinet. And 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 so that that was the uh that's what I played, but it was it was old, it was wood, but it was old and the pads leaked and the probably had cracks all over it. I had no idea and it wouldn't play. So I eventually kind of worked my way to last chair uh and would kind of like squeak my way through rehearsals in the fifth grade. And my band director is just like, all right, you're holding the band back. I'm putting you on bass clarinet where you'll do less damage. And that was it. I had a good instrument because it was the schools. Uh, and um, that first summer I went to Interlochen and then it was like off to the races. I, 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 my instrument had found me. So we have a question from Facebook from Diane Barger who said, hey. Hi. <laughs> how has playing bass clarinet informed or influenced your soprano clarinet playing and vice versa? Um, <clears throat> uh, well, there's a couple ways I could approach the answer to that. Um, Bass clarinet has has allowed me to play with a little bit more of a free free setup, right? So it's a it's maybe a looser embouchure. It's definitely uh, more free blowing. I mean, I choose clarinets that are not resistant, um, and I choose a setup and a you know mouthpiece everything that is very not resistant. And that comes from having played something like that on the bass clarinet for a long time. Uh, and then my approach to music, uh, which is the other half of that question, my my approach to playing uh, music has, has been informed by doing, playing, playing music on the bass clarinet, generally you're playing music that's new, right? So the composer's probably alive um, and you may be the first person to ever play it. And there's a lot of freedom, right? You're playing pieces with no baggage. Like the Mozart, think about the Mozart concerto. The Mozart, Mozart concerto, every one of you knows exactly uh, what's wrong with the person that's performing it on the stage. They're like, oh, well, they, they trilled from the bottom and like all of that stuff. And so there's, that's like baggage, right? Everyone has an opinion. When you're playing bass clarinet and a new piece of music, you're, you're packing the bags. So part of the, uh, part of my approach to playing old music, old music, uh, you know, music with baggage is to just not care uh, what, what is conventional. And, uh, you know, if I decide I want to do something that might be stylistically incorrect because I'm playing a classical piece, but I use some sort of a romantic ism in it. I don't care. I live in 2020. 
a lot has happened, right? I mean, you can look at it from a, I'm going to play this very purely, and that is that is legitimate, and that is a that is a thing to get as close to what happened in 1790 as possible. But I don't live there, and I choose, and it's a choice to to um, to play it how I want to play it, uh, and opinions be damned. And I think part of that comes from, you know, I grew up in, I came of musical age in the 80s. And you had Anthony Pei and Charlie Nydick releasing their recordings of the Mozart Concerto, which here to like before then it was all like Robert Marcellus. That was the recording that we all bowed down to. And here are these two youngsters, uh, especially Charlie was in his maybe in his 20s when he recorded it. Uh, and it just blew the lid off. And now everybody is able feel feels free to be able to do it. It was like somebody finally, you know, uh, farted in church and now everyone feels comfortable. Sorry, was that a bad Metaphor? Okay. The next question, do you have any advice between splitting practice time between multiple instruments? Um, it really depends if you're, if you're like preparing for a particular gig where you have to play them. Yes, you should play them all every day. Uh, I don't because I'm not. Um, and I, and I like to go deep rather than staying broad. So if I really want to do some work on clarinet, I do work on clarinet. And I don't play the bass clarinet, and I don't feel guilty. And uh, you know, when I when I get back to the bass clarinet, my reeds may stink. I may feel whatever rusty or something like that. But I don't I don't worry about that. So if that's but if you're if I'm preparing something where I have to like double or more, I have to have all the instruments played every day. And another question. Oh, sorry, Jessica. Did you have something to say? I was just going to say we had a question in Q and A from Bill here asking. For uh, with regards to recording, how long does it take you to produce a five minute video? <clears throat> and do you do your own audio video production? I think we need oh, an yeah. answer to that. Yeah, I do everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, even before COVID. <laughs> well, it depends on what it's about, right? If I'm making a video like that September video, that took a lot of planning. Uh, it took a lot of editing. Uh, the video I put up yesterday, I recorded it in a few hours. I edited it in an hour and a half and it was up by the end of the day. So like I woke up, had breakfast, started making a video and before dinner, um, it was done. So it really depends on what I'm doing. Um, you know, you get faster at it as you get used to it and you, you develop little tricks, uh, especially like if you make a mistake and I'm, I'm delivering something, I just, I don't turn off the video and start it again cause I can know I just edit it out. So I just start the sentence again and keep going. So I, I like do these, long stream of consciousness, making mistakes, coming back, saying the sentence again, and then just editing it together uh, for the final product. That just is, that's a trick that I use to go faster. But when I'm playing music, I tend to record the clarinet parts first. Like if I'm doing like one of those music video types of things, I record, look, even Nicholas records his stuff first. You know, um, part of it is it allows you to focus on one thing at a time. I'm gonna play this piece and, and some of the music is hard. So you record it. You edit it if you need to, and then you do the recording, uh, which is more like a music video. You're playing the music through a speaker and you're playing along to it, but really you're not using the music that you play along to. You're using the recording that you did. And so that allows you to focus just on the video at that point. And so again, all of that just takes a long time to do that whole September video, uh, including like arranging it, um, recording it, hating it, rearranging it, re-recording it, <laughs> uh, and then making a video. That was three or four months. So we have another question from Victoria who says, I'm playing your piece Drift this semester at my university and I'm finding that it's hard for me to really groove. I'm not as cool as you. Um, do you have any tips for people <laughs> trying to play more modern, <laughs> free, more modern music after being confined to very rigid classical music for so long? Boy, is that a good question. Um, cause you're, you got it exactly right. I mean, um, those pieces like mine and the stuff that I write and what I like is it's all about feel. It's not about like, you know, uh, gosh, it, it's not about, I, I don't want to say it's not about accuracy, but it's, it's, it's about feel and you get your, you get everything from your ears, right? You know, if you're playing a wrong note, not because you fingered it because you're hearing it wrong and you're like, Oh, that's a wrong note. And your brain through your ears is what's telling you. So your ears are super powerful. They're, they're there for you when you have to practice and you're noticing things that you're doing wrong. You have to activate your ears. Uh, and if you can't multitask with listening and playing, you record yourself and you listen back to it and let you let your ears tell you what you did wrong. The same thing goes with feel. You have to listen 
to and sometimes play along with other musicians. So when I was starting to learn how to do uh, the kind of music that I do all the time, I don't know if you want to call it jazz, whatever, I spent a lot of time listening to players and transcribing their solos and then playing along with them so that I could understand and, and imitate their feel. So I have a bunch of videos on that about sort of uh, become a more flexible player. Uh, a lot of that is uh, me playing along with jazz sax players, uh, you know, because it's a totally different instrument. So it nat naturally is a totally different approach and trying to play like them with the same feel, same articulation, same rhythm, that kind of stuff. So as far as drift is concerned, uh, <laughs> you could play along with me. So there's a recording of drift. You can play along and try and line up what you're doing to what I'm doing, not by reading it on the page, but by knowing it and playing it along with the recording. And then you'll get a, then you'll start to get a feel at least how I do it. And then you can, then you can move on from there because, you know, I am not the be all and end all of, of anything. So, uh, but, but that's the best way is to use your ears. Let those inform you. Can you talk some about some of your other compositions? I know you've written quite a lot. Yeah. Um, I've written quite a lot. Um, I wrote a lot because there wasn't a lot written that I really wanted to play. Uh, I studied with Harry Sparnay, uh, and I loved the pieces that I learned of his. And I learned, I mean, my goal there was to learn a piece a week. And sometimes that was difficult. This was back in 1989 when I studied with him. Um, and uh, once I got through about 25 pieces, um, I'll, I'll, I'll have to confess that Brian Fernie, our time in motion study, didn't take a week. It took a few more weeks. <laughs> but um, but no, I, I, I kind of ran out of pieces of his that I liked. And so I, you know, I looked around the US and I, com I contacted composers and um, and then I realized, you know what, I don't need to support, you know, people who are famous, it would be better for me to support people who are around me. So I started building like a little network of friends, some of them wrote for me, and then I started writing for myself. And I realized, Kind of like the music that I write. No, no offense to everybody else, but I like the music I write, so I'm just going to keep writing it. Uh, upside of that is I play music that I write. Upside of that is that I can change it if I can't play it. Downside of it is I'm not really a great composer because uh, I'm not trained to, you know, you write yourself into a corner and you're like, oh man, I've got a problem. I don't know how to finish this piece. or I don't know how to get around this problem. As clarinet players, when we find a problem, we were trained to learn how to solve the problem. As a composer, I don't have that training. So I have a lot of abandoned pieces that sort of are littering my hard drive. Uh, that I will pull out after years and years and be like, oh, wait, I know how to solve this now. And then I continue it. So Do you have any I don't know if that answers pieces? your question. I kind of- Yeah, it, it did. Um, what are your favorite pieces that you've written if you have favorites? Usually the last one I wrote um, is my favorite. It's the one that kind of runs through my head all the time. Um, but of, of all of the pieces, uh, I would say a couple of my favorites are But Would She Remember You, which is old, um, from 1993 or four, I wrote it, or 96. Um, I like Little Bit, which is one I do with harmonica. Um, and, and these new pieces that I'm writing, I'm really enjoying, actually. So what I'm doing now is I had an album called Ten Children that came out when my kid was three. Uh, and... She's graduating college this year, so I'm doing another 10 children. So there'll be 20 children uh, and I'll release both of the, the, uh, the volumes together. I'm gonna re-record the first 10 children and I will record the next 10 children. And then I think I'll be done with children for a while. Maybe you could talk some about your YouTube channel. When did you start it? What equipment, um, oh, what God. your process is for creating? I know some people probably want to know, you know, what's your setup? How do you record them? Where's your inspiration come from? Um, so I started my YouTube channel pretty much when YouTube started uh, in 2005. Just happened to be coincidence. Um, uh, in 2005, I quit my orchestra job. I quit the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center, I quit Steve Reich Ensemble, I quit the Klezmatics, and I took an advertising job. Um, I made a decision that I wanted to do, I wanted to change my main track so that I could enjoy the music track more than I was. That's the short story. But also that year happened to be the year in 2005 that YouTube was founded, and I was like, I need an outlet. So I started making, you know, as many people did, performance videos. None of those are up anymore. Uh, I pulled them all down. Uh, but then I started realizing I had students who, um, you know, would 
come take a lesson with me. And this one student in particular, I always tell this story. She would come take a lesson. I'd be like, go, I want you to go listen to this person play this piece. And I would go listen to a recording. All of our teachers say that, go listen. Like I just said, you, it's all about your ears. So she would go on YouTube and listen to other high schoolers play it. And I'd be like, nope, that's not the point. And um, so what I would do once I realized it kind of as a joke is that she'd leave and I'd record the piece so that when she searched for it, she'd find me and I'd be like, hey, idiot. Remember when I told you to find somebody to listen to? Don't, no, not, not me. But anyway, I would record it for her and I would give her a lesson on it again. And I started realizing other people were watching those. And so uh, eventually I started doing them not just for her. Uh, and they weren't so specific, like, you know, I won't say her name, but let's say her name was, was Jill. Jill, this is for you. No, it was then it started becoming for everybody. And then I started looking at them, the, like who was watching it. And I started sort of tailoring what I did for those who watched. I started realizing sax players were watching it. I didn't intended for sax players to watch it, but they were. So, you know, now I start to sort of, you know, I try to cross those borders as they show up uh, at my doorstep and you just kind of evolve. And that's, you know, uh, it, it is an evolving thing. As anybody knows, making content is, is not easy because you have to come up with a, the idea. And if the idea is boring or if the idea is something that everyone else is doing, um, you know, then what are you? You know, you're doing the exact same thing. So I try to find a slant on it. And there's certain things that I won't do on my channel. I won't do reaction videos. I won't make fun of people. Uh, that's just not something that I, I, I subscribe to. Another I make question. fun of products. I make fun of products all the time, actually. <laughs> but yeah, but people know. <laughs> um, what top three skills for upcoming bass clarinetists that you see neglected the most often? Breathing and supporting, articulation, um, and voicing. Now, if you know what any of those things mean, you have you, those are the three keys to the kingdom. But in short, breathing, you need, to you need to have enough air. I hear a lot of bass clarinet players who are trying to use not most, a lot of clarinet players who are learning uh, are, are not using forceful air. They're using the kind of air that they use and the kind of air pressure they use to breathe. They're like, huh. no, that's not it. Um, you, you need to have like a real support system that's able to blow a candle out at 20 feet kind of thing. You know, you need to have air. So it's often about that. So that's what I mean by supporting it. And you can't just sort of blow and then take a breath and then blow because then you can't sustain anything. So it's about controlling that air. So that's that whole system that people neglect. And especially as you move from clarinet to bass, which takes a lot more air, you have a bigger mouthpiece, the instrument bore is bigger, all that. Uh, that's where the problem lies. Um, articulation, man, people uh, are just not used to having a big thing in their mouth. And so articulation starts to get really thuddy. They don't know how to handle that. Um, and then thirdly, the, the, the voicing is, each note on the bass clarinet, especially as you get up in the higher register, requires that you have a slightly different tongue position and not embouchure, but sort of, it's like the whole thing is different uh, for every note. And so if you're squeaking or if you're grunting, it's because your tongue position isn't in your embouchure and your voicing and all that stuff is, in the wrong, is, is not in the right place. So you have to learn where that is until it becomes second nature so that when you play an A, your tongue automatically goes to the right position. And if you're playing a high E, it goes to the right position. If you're playing a low C, it goes to the right position. So that comes from practice. And those are things that people who are just coming onto the bass clarinet, they don't know because they haven't done it yet. Next hey, question. Todd. Sorry. Harness versus stand-up peg. I'm sorry? Harness versus stand-up Har peg, harness. Mm -hmm. Yep. Harness, 100% harness. Uh, it's a harness knot that goes around my neck. I have this kind that my, my uh, student Phil Everall makes and I sell them if you're interested. They hook onto your belt. Yes, they give you a little bit of a bums rush if they pull on your belt, but you know what? No one's looking there except your pianist. Um, and uh, the thing about a peg is it, 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 it tethers you to the ground and I move around like a moron. So I, I kind of need to not be attached to a peg. The other thing about pegs is they wobble and it feels weird. So we have uh, a lot more questions. Given your unique career path and story, do you have any advice for clarinet hobbyists who do not work in the clarinet industry who wish to improve their clarinet skills and continue progressing? It really depends on what your goals are, right? Uh, I mean, if you think about it, if, if your goal is to play in a community band, that's different than if your goal is to make an album or to make a video, or if it's to be able to play the Francais Concerto, uh, you know, those are different goals. So it really depends on what you want. 
Um, so, I, you know, generally speaking, you're more successful when you do something you enjoy than when you do something you don't. And a lot of us these days, of course, are spending a lot of time in our practice rooms by ourselves. And if that's lonely, there are tons now of, uh, you know, play along videos that I'm seeing. X, there's there's a, a woman who does excerpts. You can play along with her. Uh, you know, a number of us uh, in the community have made sort of play along videos for duos and trios and quartets and stuff like that. So it gives you the semblance of, of playing in an ensemble or, you know, you could, you know, there are a lot of different ways to, to do that. But um, I don't think that's your question. The general thing is you got to do what you enjoy. If you want to play in a musical ensemble, you know, it's very easy to find nowadays, you know, with uh, with the interwebs. Uh, you, you can locate a, an ensemble. You can even start an ensemble yourself. I know here in Brooklyn, there are, are at least a half a dozen bands that you could join. Um, and you know, and there are different levels as well. So, uh, so that's what I recommend. And then in terms of your own progress, try not to listen to idiots on YouTube, you know, try to find an actual teacher uh, who can be very specific. I mean, you can only go so far uh, of self-diagnosis. You wouldn't go to a, you wouldn't go to YouTube to figure out why, you know, your liver is hurting, <laughs> you know? So there's sometimes you need to go to a specialist that, that, and, and even if it's like, yep, you're doing the right thing. You're doing great. Here are a few exercises. See me and come see me in a month. You know, that might be the equivalent of take two aspirin and call me in the morning, but you sometimes it's good to go to a to a teacher uh, and have them diagnose specific issues that you're having. Not like you have to go to a teacher every week. That's one other thing that people don't understand is you're not people aren't like, wait, you didn't call me this week. You hate me. No, I understand. You need to take one lesson. That's cool. See ya. Come back when you're ready. So I don't know if that answers your question. I answered it in about four different ways. So hopefully one of those works. The next one, I'm sure that many of us have watched your video on how to mic a bass clarinet many, many times during the last 10 months. Do you have any updates, any new microphones or anything else that you like? No, um, I am still using, um, let's see if I can pull this into frame, uh, this. This is my recording mic. That's not the mic you're, I'm talking through a different mic up here, which is a, a shotgun mic. But this is, this is the microphone I use uh, to record with. Uh, it's a tube mic. Uh, it's, uh, it's called the Gemini. It's by SE Electronics and I've had it for a few years and I really like it. So, you know, when you have something that you like, you stick with it. I'm trying to make sure I have all the questions answered. Mm -hmm. They're coming in from Facebook and here. Um, do you have any favorite YouTube videos that you've done? That I've done? September is my favorite. Um, I really enjoyed the one where I made this, this barrel out of uh, a piece of wood that I got at a junkie, well, at a lumber yard. That was kind of fun. Uh, Cause I didn't, I've always wondered if that was possible. Most of the videos that I enjoy are where I'm doing sort of pseudoscience. <laughs> uh, and then, then there are a few of the, the performance videos that I enjoy that I've made. Let's see, here's a question. Do you work on your reads to make them better or do you toss them if they aren't good out of the box? <laughs> Um, a little of both. Um, you know, the, um, I am fortunate that um, I have someone who supports my habit of playing bass clarinet by offering me uh, reeds uh, that I don't have to pay for. That said, though, you know, every read is a little bit different. And so I, I do work on my reads. But I, you know, if a read is too far gone, life's too short. So a few more questions. Do you use the same microphone for B-flat clarinet? Yes. Yes. Okay. So what you want to get is a large diaphragm microphone. So there, well, you know what? Don't even listen to that. You could do great with a small diaphragm microphone. I like large diaphragm microphones. Uh, and small diaphragm microphones look, look a little bit more like a pencil. The large diaphragm microphones are these, you know, big hulking things uh, that look like you know what you're doing, <laughs> you know. Um, so uh, the only kind of microphone I wouldn't recommend is something like a, a vocal mic, like um, uh, like a Shure SM57 or 58. Those are like good for guitar cabinets and drums they're, and vocals. They're not so good for clarinets. Part of it has to do with how the, the electronics inside of them are a little bit different than a condenser microphone is a dynamic microphone. So they don't have as much of a dynamic range. So when you play quietly, it doesn't sound as good as, you know, but you can play as loud as you want and you won't destroy it. You could also hammer nails with it and you wouldn't destroy it. Uh, so, you know, you don't have to spend a ton though. Um, you can get a really good microphone for like two or $300. Anybody with a blue Yeti, you know, that's fine. 
that's fine. Until you want to start like, you know, recording for Deutsche Grammophon, that Blue Yeti is fine. And probably even if you did want to record for Deutsche Grammophon. <laughs> Um, let's see, from Facebook, I love that Michael doesn't stick himself into any one box. So inspiring. Who inspires you? What are some of the most unique and creative musical projects you've seen during the pandemic? I can answer the most creative and unique uh, project that I saw was uh, by my friend Jason Robert Brown. Um, he is a composer uh, that I met in college. He wrote me one of the very first pieces that were ever written for me for bass clarinet and hi-hat. It was called Ego Trip. I wonder where he came up with that. Um, and so he um, he did this. He, he's written a ton of musicals. And in one of his musicals, uh, he found uh, a young high schooler uh, who was a breakout star named Ariana Grande. And so he did a he did a, a thing in March or April with uh, a bunch of musicians, uh, almost all of whom I know that are in his band. Uh, and they, they did this amazing show where everybody's in their own square, like we're all used to seeing different people in their own rooms. And then she showed up and sang a tune that she sang in that show that when she was in high school or whatever. And um, oh my God, that was just like chills up the spine. Uh, that to me was it. And I also recently saw this Christian McBride duo that he did where it was in real time and they were able somehow to get the delay to not be a delay and they could actually play live together. And that was really cool. Uh, I mean, just sort of figuring out we're in the early stages of this kind of technology and people are figuring it out as they go along. What inspires me um, are, gosh, uh, I get inspired by some kind, some DJs. I get inspired by um, some producers, generally speaking, artists like singers and stuff like that. Just to be clear, I, I don't listen to a lot of classical music. I listen to a lot of jazz. I listen to a lot of electronic music. I listen to pop. I'm just like, I'm like a, a high school kid that way. And, uh, but what interests me is some of the production techniques that producers use. These are the people that you have to look in the credits to be able to see. And, and it's, it's when I hear something really interesting that's been produced in a really neat way that catches my ear, um, that's when I pay attention. So uh, Laura Mvula is somebody I think has been doing some interesting stuff. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, um, even Brian Eno has been doing a ton of interesting stuff. And Brian Eno has been around since Roxy Music in the 70s and did all that ambient music in the 80s. And he's coming out with new stuff that's really interesting. And he's got to be pushing 80. So anyway, uh, those are just a few. The next one. Um... Does humor belong in music? And Mike is a living answer. So maybe you could talk some about that. <laughs> well, I just think that a lot of people take themselves seriously. Um, you can take your work seriously. You can take music seriously, but you can't really take yourself that seriously or you start to look like an ass. So um, I think there's, a. I mean, you, you, you can do stuff to be provocative like Zappa, right? Who, and, and you can do stuff to be provocative like John Cage. Uh, and, and that's a decision that you make to decide you, you're provoking people. I don't generally like to do things to provoke people um, just to be provocative that way uh, or an iconoclast. Um, some things that I do piss people off. Uh, I, I hear about it every so often when somebody sends me a link to some clarinet list where people are mad at me for saying something or doing something um, or just being snarky. But uh, I think humor... If they call it playing music, <laughs> they don't call it scowling music. So, you know, it should be, it should be fun and you should be able to enjoy it and smiling and laughing is part of it. The next one, where can we find that Jason Robert Brown video? All right. Ariana Grande? Uh, uh, type in Google, Jason Robert Brown and oh, Ariana wait. Grande. We might have this already. Is that it, Jessica? I think so. I can okay. click it. I can is it look. Still hurting. Oh my God! Yes, this is it. Yes, that's it. That's it. All over that. Yep. Awesome. Let's see. Um, maybe you could talk some about your practice routine. What does a typical practice session look like for you? Uh, throwing on a read and playing. Uh, you know, these days, look, I'm I'm 52 years old. Um, I have a full time job, a new dog a house, a life, I like to cook. Um, so practicing, I practice when I need to learn something. 
And that's partly why I'm writing and I'm writing some music that's really freaking hard. And so I'll just, I'll sit there and I'll go through the same set, same set of uh, routines that I always did. Do I do long tones? Not usually anymore, I should. Do I do scales? Not usually anymore, I should. Um, but I still throw my metronome at 40 and I work it up to 160 every single time. Um, and because that's how I learn music. I learn music by slowing it down, not trying to cut corners and practicing in all of the inflections that I don't want. So I don't practice it first for notes and then practice it then for dynamics and then practice it a third time for something for musicality. I practice everything in at 40. So if I'm doing a crescendo over four bars, I'm going 40 beats per minute. It's a long ass crescendo, but I'm doing it because that's what I'm playing. I'm learning the music. I'm not just learning the notes. Uh, and that is something I recommend to all my students. Another question, new ligature or long tones opinions? What? I'm guessing, and correct me if I'm wrong, Lori, um, do you mean to get a new ligature to help your sound or maybe long tones to improve your sound? Correct me if that's not what you meant. Well, I can answer that. If, if it is what you meant, no. Uh, you don't buy gear to fix a problem unless the gear is broken. <laughs> you know, if, you have a med, if you have a ligature that is like, broken, then you buy a new ligature, but you don't buy gear to fix a problem. You try to fix the problem and then you get new gear to support the, what you fixed. Um, if, you, if you're constantly looking for the bullet that will cure, or the, the vaccine, here we go, the vaccine that will cure a musical virus that you have, um, you're going to be really unhappy and also a lot poorer. So I don't, I don't, I don't really um, buy into this ligature or, and if you don't believe me, you know, Jessica, you can post my ligature video. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, once you have the sound in your ear, you can make the sound out of your instrument unless there is something physically wrong with your horn, in which case get that fixed. But buying ligatures because you think this one is warmer, or you think this one is freer, you know, maybe, but the change is so different that it has, it, it's, it's probably more likely something that's in here or in here than it is on, on your instrument. Now, long tones, yeah, do long tones. Uh, long tones are important for so many reasons. They're, they allow you to keep the, figure out how to, how to um, keep the part of your, I mean, your mouth, try to hold your tongue still. So stick it out and look in the mirror. You can't. These are, these are parts of your body that just simply don't uh, behave. And so doing long tones helps you to learn how to make them behave as best you can. Embouchure, size of your mouth, you know, air, all this stuff is something that we're not used to um, to focusing on and making consistent, and that's where long tones come in. Do it. The next one, a while ago, you mentioned in a video that you started working on looping with Ableton. Could you talk a little bit more about that, or could you someday do a tutorial on using Ableton? Uh, well, I'll take that in opposite uh, order. Uh, Ableton, there are a million tutorials about doing something in Ableton. I don't need to do that. Um, I could, but, um, you know, like I said, I look on YouTube for videos about Ableton and stuff like that. So I don't, uh, I, I, I would, like I said, if, if somebody else is making it, I don't need to make it. Um, but uh, yeah, so I used to use a program uh, called um, uh, Max MSP. This is a program that used to just do uh, electronic, like MIDI. It didn't allow you to do like manipulation of audio because this is back in 1990 when computers like could barely do word processing. So, um, you know, gradually computers have become more powerful and, and Max MSP grew with it and allowed you to do, you could create your own live looping instruments and using plugins and, but mostly it was a, it's a, it's almost like a program language, uh, programming language, but it's not like C sound, it's visually programming. Um, but that, I think I hit the limit of that. Um, and it started to really not behave in concerts. It was crashing, it, you know, and I love the software much more than Ableton, but I, I eventually ported all of my pieces, which took two or three years to move all of my pieces that were in Max to Ableton to make them work the same way. And now I'm just writing in Ableton and it's getting easier. Um, but that's not, when I write music, I write in Logic and I, I sort of set it up that way. And then I, then I, port that over to Ableton so that I can play it live. And that's my process, always. So I could maybe make a video about that. The next question, do you plan on doing any more master classes soon, even virtually? 
Um, I don't think I've been invited to do any. <laughs> so, uh, so no, I don't think I have any on the schedule right at the moment. I suppose we could fix that. <laughs> but sure. Another question. I once heard that musicality should take precedence because the musical ideas of a piece will often show you what technique you should use to work on or what you should work on, sorry. Uh, do you share this view or does it depend on the situation? I think everything depends on the situation, but I don't want to dis I don't want to dismiss the question. Um, well, so it really depends on what you mean by musicality. Um, you can't really be musical if you can't play the notes <laughs> or the rhythm or make a nice sound, right? There's certain fundamentals that are craft-based uh, that need to be in existence in your playing, right? Before you can start to sort of sculpt a piece of art. So like, let's just think about this in a different way. Let's think about, you know, painting or even, even something more that we've probably all done. Let's talk about clay. You know, if you don't know how to make a pot, you cannot start making beautiful vases if you don't know how to do the fundamentals, the craft, right? It's like that with any, any art. Um, and it's obviously the same as music. So you need to keep your fundamentals in check. A lot of people are like, I'll get the fundamentals as I go along. And, some, and to an extent, that's always true. We're always learning. But, uh, but I, I, um, I would say that you cannot be musical unless, you, like I, I said this before, you can't be musical unless you have craft. So technique. You know, I, I don't I don't think I buy into that now that you've asked it that way. One of my own questions for you, what advice would you give to musicians, especially younger musicians that are just starting out during the pandemic? Um, just general advice. I know the last year has been really tough for everyone. Yeah. Um, so I have actually an answer to that because somebody's asked me that before. And and so I, this is going to be a medium length answer. Um, Right now, we have no idea what's going to happen with orchestras. Some of them have folded. Some of them will come back. Um, you know, we can all hope. Um, but that's the past, right? That's, that's an old model that has worked and worked and worked and worked. But it was clear that it stopped working as soon as nobody could go to halls. Uh, it's, it started being unhealthy long before COVID, as a lot of us know. Economically, it's very challenging to, you know, if it's, if you, if you look at, 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 uh, at an orchestra as an artistic or a musical or experience, think about the cost that goes into making that production. You have to pay all of the musicians and all of the librarians and all of the people on the stage and the conductor, uh, all of that. And then you think you could have another kind of musical experience that might be just as profound with a string trio. That is gonna cost less economically, right? So it's thinking about sort of the economics of music, but to answer your question, I'm just trying to put in your mind into like, you have to start thinking outside of the, the box that we've all been set into, especially if you've been in a, in a conservatory, you're in a box of like, this is what you do, then you take an audition, you get a job. This is what you do, then you take interviews and you get a teaching job. This is what you do and you start playing in shows and then you have a theater job. Like the, the, those rules have stopped applying and all of you, everybody, teachers, famous people, Richard Stoltzman, everybody. Uh, has uh, has been like, all right, well, don't know what to do here. So here's where your opportunity lies. The last time that there was a huge uh, sort of uh, crisis, I don't know what the right word is. Uh, if you think about it, sort of the, the, the housing uh, bust in 2008, right? So you think about that. So a lot of people, uh, you know, were put out of jobs. There were a lot of, you know, the people who had invested, all that stuff, had, you know, people were losing money left and right, losing jobs left and right. And look at the businesses that started during that. You look at Airbnb started, Uber started during those two. So let's think about those two. What did that mean? People lost their jobs and these companies formed to say, all right, well, maybe we don't need a work. Oh, WeWork started during that as well. Oh, people don't have an office. We will give you offices. But let's think about Uber. I don't have a job. I can drive a car. I have a car. And now I can be part of something and now I can support myself. Same thing with Airbnb. Well, I don't know. I, I can rent out my couch. I can rent out my guest room. I can rent out my second home. Uh, you know, so people looked at it and said, huh, 
all right, well, this is the this is what's happening. This is the human condition. I have empathy as an entrepreneur. I will figure out a way to help the world and help myself at the same time. So you've seen that in you've seen that in the world of tech. What's happening in the world of music right now is partly on all of you who are starting out and figuring out what is it going to be. Is it figuring out a way to do concerts online where people can can um, can play in, in disparate locations without uh, without having any kind of delay in latency and be able to perform? Is it uh, is it an online concert series? And I'm making stupid ideas that are really obvious, but there's some really profound ones if you think about it. Like how is this? The good things about all of what we're doing right now is we have more time. So how can you take advantage of what's good about this and then weave that into something that you want to keep even when this is all over and we're all going to restaurants and everybody's healthy and hugging again. So that's what I recommend. Don't look backwards for the answer because the answer is here. And if you're spending your time looking backwards, you're not going to find it back there because the people back there are also struggling with it. So I would say, you know, you have to start thinking um, entrepreneurially. Uh, I have to commend, you know, ICA. They're like, hell, all right, we're going to do this online. That's great. But I could imagine what would an actual convention be like if we were to do an actual convention where we all feel like we're participating, where we all feel like we're in a hall together, where I can con I, I can have somebody sitting next to me that I can talk to and, you know, borrow a virtual cough drop from, you know, like, what does all of that mean? And so thinking that way and blowing up what we're doing from being, Ugh, this is so horrible to there's some good about this. What can we do and expand that? I think is the answer. And young people who frankly have the least to lose are the ones that are going to figure it out. So there's my sermon. Brilliant. Absolutely inspirational. Oh, um, what aspects of your work in advertising do you find have influenced your work in music? Oh, that's easy. Um, and vice versa. Uh, advertising is all about performing to an audience you can't see. Think about it, right? I write an ad, goes on TV, you see it. I don't see you seeing it. I don't see you laughing to it. I don't see you going out and buying that product. So there's data that, that shows you the reaction. Now, TV is a tough one because you can't really measure it. But if you're thinking about online advertising, let's, think, let's talk about Facebook for a second. Put an ad on Facebook, I'm selling a barrel. I don't want to make it up. And I, uh, and I put it out there and I see the people that are clicking on it. Uh, I start to be like, oh, okay, well, maybe I should be tailoring the, the, uh, the product to be cheaper because it's a lot of young people and they, you know, they're, you know, it needs to be inexpensive or I need to make something that's higher end or, you know, you make these kinds of decisions, but it's all reading the data. So with YouTube, I read the data all the time. I'm able to see when people stop watching a video, what they rewind, how old they are, um, how many times they've watched it, where they live. Uh, I, there's so much data. And if you don't go in there and know what you're looking at, you can't learn anything from it. So learning about data, I put out, a, I put out something on YouTube. I can't see the people watching it, just like a TV commercial. But I do have data that shows me what, what went right and what may go wrong. And then you'd write up a hypothesis in your head. Okay, well, you know, I thought this would be really funny and a lot of people would watch it. Like my barrel video didn't do well. I really don't know why, um, you know, but okay. Uh, you, you learn from it, you see the parts of it that were successful and then you move on and you try to iterate with something new. So that's where advertising, it's, it's an iterative process. You perform your advertising, you read the audience using data and then you make changes and you perform again. And that's, that's, that's how uh, I look at it in terms of uh, doing the music that I do online. But at the same time, when I play a concert, you know when people are getting bored. You know when people are shifting or looking at their phones nowadays or, uh, you know, the, you can tell. And so that's also a bit of information. Maybe I shouldn't do the repeats. You know, maybe I should cut this whole piece. This piece is not going over well. I'm sorry. Sorry, Mozart. Your piece isn't cutting it for my show. Uh, so you're not getting played by me. That's okay. Mozart's dead. So, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, being able to read an audience is also really important. And that all just comes from, again, from empathy and being and, and, and listening and watching and, and caring and paying attention. What other skills do you think musicians should have besides musical skills, of course, technique, sound, all of that, but non-music related skills to help musical careers? Business. 
You need to know business. You need to understand music is a business. There is the, there's mu the music business and there's the business of music. Um, and this is, of course, if you want to be a professional, right, doing music. Obviously, that's not important if you're, you know, playing in a community band or whatever. Um, but if, if you're in school and you're making a living out of this, you, you need to understand the living part of making a living. And so understanding everything from, and this is not a bad time to learn how to start doing your taxes and figuring out what it is to have a Schedule C and figuring out what's, what you can write off. And all of those things are going to serve you the rest of your life. Um, and also, those skills are transferable. You know, if you think about performing a concert, um, I go to I go to the uh, to the op well back when I went to the office, and I would I would watch people give presentations to try and sell an idea to a client. And you're in a you're in a conference room and you're talking to them either in person or through you know Zoom or whatever, and people don't know how to they get nervous. You people, all of you who stood out and played a recital. You've played out, you stood up there by yourself, you played a concert in front of a group of people, some of whom you knew, maybe some of whom you didn't know, and you made it through it. And then you had poise and you were able to pick yourself up if something went wrong. Hell, there are people who can't give a toast at a wedding and you can do that. That's a transferable skill that you need to start looking at as a, you know, okay, well, if I did need to make a living, what are some of these transferable skills? I'm disciplined. I know how to practice. I can perform. I can address an audience. I know when to shut up. You know, all of, well, I don't know when to shut up, but I know when to shut up. So those are, those are the kinds of things that, that uh, if you start looking at them, they're transferable skills. And then you start acting like they're transferable skills. And all of a sudden you're looking at the business of music or just business. It's one way to so look at it. There are a lot of answers to that question. I'll do that um, question. How well are universities and conservatories preparing students for careers in music today? What are they missing? <laughs> um, when was the last time? I'm going to answer that question with a question. Ask your performer, ask your professor, excuse me, the last time they made a video on YouTube. Ask your professor the last time they, Im they improvised something when they had a memory slip. Ask your professor the last time they wrote a cadenza from scratch on paper and then played it. Ask your professor the last time they improvised. Ask your professor the last time they released a CD. Ask your professor any of those things and some of them will be able to answer you and some of them won't. How many of those things are valid today? Well, maybe a CD isn't, but the rest of them are super valid. Are those things that students should know when they leave a school after having paid a quarter of a million dollars? I would argue yes. So, um, you know, so are music, are music schools preparing students for the world out here? Do you feel prepared? So that's, um, that's my answer. So maybe as people start asking themselves these questions and they want to learn more skills, what resources would you give? Where would you suggest people learn these or like websites, books, um, podcasts, anything like that? Well, again, if you're young, you have very little to lose. So let's say COVID, the world is healed. That'll happen someday. Um, and maybe it's time for you to step out of your comfort zone and put on a concert series. Maybe you need to reach out to that coffee shop and say, you know what? Let's bring more people into your coffee shop to drink coffee. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to schedule musicians every you know, Thursday evening. Um, and I'm going to learn, when you learn how to do something like that, you learn about scheduling. You learn about uh, production, how to produce a live event. You learn about how, <laughs> how difficult musicians can be. <laughs> you learn about uh, marketing. You learn about uh, reading an audience. You learn about business. You learn about taking tickets. You learn about swag. You learn about all that stuff. So what do you do? You go out and you, 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 you put yourself in a position and you say, either you say yes to somebody who offers it to you or you invent it yourself and you do it. Um, repeat the question one more time to make sure I'm not going too far off topic. Um, what resources? So as people ask themselves, right. like, so, how do okay, I learn? So the, answer, the answer to that question is the resource is yourself. You figure it out. So, you know, if you need to make tickets, you figure out where to get tickets made, if you even need tickets. If you need to, if you need to advertise somewhere online, you figure out how to do Facebook advertising. It's super easy. It's all self-service. So, you know, you, you can learn it yourself online. You can learn it yourself in, on YouTube. Uh, you know, you can, you, you, there are tons and tons of resources. You can read a book. It really depends on how you learn. 
Some people learn by doing and failing and picking up and doing again. Some people learn by reading a textbook. Some people learn by watching a bunch of videos. It really depends on you. Uh, so you, all of those could be uh, valid. But I tend to think that people are successful when they have to apply the thing they're learning. So if you are learning about you know, the business of music, you should start a music business. Doesn't matter if it's gonna be big or successful. You learn much, much more by like, oh, I'm gonna make a website. Well, what am I gonna make a website about? Well, you have a music business now, you know? So, so you start to apply all of these things and then you start to learn. So I, I, I tend to learn by doing and I just throw myself into situations where I don't know anything uh, and hopefully I won't go to jail for it. So the next question, let's see, um, it is really hard to find resources generally on how to do audio mixing for small chamber music ensembles for our in-home recording situations that apply to classical music, specifically acoustic music not involving bass, drums, guitar. For example, it's really challenging to take a bunch of recorded tracks from a wind quintet all recorded remotely and then properly mix and master the tracks in a way that would be able to do a virtual concert and have it something that I would be happy to present. Do you have any advice on where to start in that area? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, people all have very different environments. This is this room that I'm in is the room that I record everything in. Um, you can't see in front of me, but there's, you know, there's uh, acoustical panels, there's some on the ceiling. Um, you know, I have treated this room, it's not perfect, obviously, uh, but, uh, but it's my room. My room is gonna sound different from your room if you don't have the same paneling. And the same thing is your problem. When, so like, it depends on where they're recording. It depends on what they're recording with. It depends on how closely they can stay to a metronome or however it is that you're going to be sort of coordinating the piece, uh, the, the different ensemble pieces. So you got two issues. You got them, be, you got people being able to play together and then you have the different sounds of the different rooms that they're in. The easiest thing uh, is to take sounds that are very dead and add room sounds to it, reverb. Um, and so if you could get somebody to put blankets up all inside a closet and somehow be able to record themselves inside that closet, it's not going to sound great. It'll sound really boxy, but at least it won't sound like they're in their bathroom because you've recorded in your bedroom, which has pillows and a mattress and, 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 you know, down comforters to absorb sound. So it's about figuring out, okay, all of us are going to do our thing in, uh, you know, and, and choose a room that all sounds the same and then make sure that everybody can play with a metronome. And then I think you'll have better luck. I'm just looking for any other questions I see on Facebook, you some fire, lots of like great advice, lots of compliments all across the board. Oh, thank you. So wonderful Not advice. Let's see, I'm looking for more questions. In the meantime, maybe you could talk about what um, your typical day looks like. What, what my typical day looks like? Um, well, I, I, I have a dog now. Um, this is my first pet since I was a little boy uh, that, you know, can pee and poop in the house, at least. I had fish. That doesn't really count. Um, and so my, my day now starts a lot earlier. Uh, but a typical day uh, on a weekday is, you know, I'm, I'm at work. I'm in the same chair, uh, but I'm doing different things. Um, and then, you know, I go, I go through my day. The nice thing the nicest thing about it is that if I have a half an hour break, um, I can practice. There's my horn. You know, I can just play. Uh, I don't have to commute two hours, so I can play uh, or sleep longer. Um, but now with a dog, I can't. So a typical day is that. And then uh, we have one friend in our COVID pod. Uh, and Michael comes over every single day. He lives across the street from us. And we cook. Uh, and our dogs play. And then we all go to bed. That's, I mean, in our own, that sounded weird. He goes home. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and then on weekends, I usually, uh, I'm either making a video or I'm recording. So I'm down here working on music. Um, so I, I practice as catch can during the day. And then on the weekends, it's all music all the time. Jessica, do you see any questions? I'm afraid I'm missing some. They're, they're all coming out of the comments. I just lots of lots of fire emojis. People are really happy with your answer. So my Facebook <laughs> wall is just filled with fire. Emojis, fire. So, uh, um, yeah. I answer I, all the questions I'm of just... the world. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I have one last question. I think that we can uh, we can ask you here, and I wanted to know you've done so much in your life up to this point. 
Can you t share a little bit about your future goals in the next five to 10 years, what you're hoping to achieve and things that you're interested in learning? What a nice question. Thank you for asking. Um, well, I'm looking forward to uh, retiring from, uh, from my day job. And so I can focus all of my time on like being a pilot, playing music, doing that sort of thing. Uh, you know, I, you never know, you know, it, uh, how, how much more you can grow. Um, it, it, and, you know, you put your hand on your head to see how tall you are. I mean, you have no idea. It's just your hands always on your head. So you don't know how much you've grown uh, unless you look back. Uh, so I don't know where I'm going to grow. I know things that interest me uh, continue to interest me. But other things that really interest me is, you know, I would love to teach people how to fly. Uh, I enjoy teaching. Uh, I hope that I hope that's obvious. And so, um, you know, being able to teach other things besides music, I think would be a lot of fun because, you, you know, as a teacher, I think we're all teachers here. Uh, you know, we, we grow and learn because we're teaching, because we are confronted with someone else's difficulty that we have to figure out. Maybe we didn't go through the difficulty or didn't go through it the same way. And we learn as we experiment and grow. And so, you know, you can do that in music. You can do that in, if I wanted to teach math, if I wanted to teach people how to fly or whatever uh you know it's but i think there it involves sort of continuing to to give uh because i really enjoy the process of seeing somebody get it uh and i think all teachers do uh, i kind of miss that on youtube you know fire emojis are great but you know that moment when they're like oh my god i can circular breathe now uh is is something that i just i, I love to be able to do so um in terms of music though We'll see. We'll see. You know, it's like at uh, it, it, it a point where you're all like, I think I've done everything right. I've, I've, I've said everything I'm going to say. I'm going to do everything I'm going to do. And then all of a sudden, you, and if you don't put pressure on yourself, all of a sudden you'll wake up one day. I'm like, I have an idea. So we'll see. Thank you for asking. That was very nice of you to ask. Yeah, that's a great answer. I think we all learned how to cook bread early last year. So I wish you I could do anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can't. You can. That's the other thing. Like if I was going to leave somebody with a couple of thoughts, if I was going to leave everybody with one thought. It would be that you, if anybody ever asks you if you can do something, say yes and figure it out. Then if they ask you if you can play jazz or improvise, they ask you if you know how to make sourdough starter, uh, if, you know, figure it out. Uh, if, the, if you say no, they won't ask you again. And then you won't get to do it. You'll have to wait for another person to ask you something else. Say yes and you figure it out. And you will be so much richer. You're a lot smarter and you're a lot more capable than you may think. Uh, and, and, and being, being a flexible player and preparing for those moments is all, is all about what school is, you know, is, is figuring out how to, how to do as much as you can so that you can say yes. So, uh, that would be my soapbox message is just don't ever say no, say yes and figure it out. That's great. And that's a great advice as a teacher as well. If a student asks you, don't be ashamed to say that you don't know, but also tell them that you can find the answer and you'll get back to them because you'll learn something in that process and you'll look like less of an idiot, really. <laughs> and it isn't even about that. I think students are forgiving, you know, uh, especially if you're like, you know what? Let me get you back to you on that. I don't know the answer to that rather than making it up. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming and doing this My talk. Pleasure. I know I had a wonderful time and then learned so much about not only you, but about there's a lot to chew on a lot of these answers. And I think Facebook is, is blowing up over here talking about how all of their students are going to see this video. And, and I think, oh, well, I, you know, I hope it's helpful. I'll keep doing what I'm doing. Um, you know, it's always helpful when people write comments or uh, write messages to me uh, from my site so that uh, I start to know what it, it's another data point that allows me to know what people want or they don't want. Um, and so just, you know, keep those calls and letters coming. Yeah. And, Please definitely check out Mike's um, uh, YouTube channel. Um, you can just search for his name or you can search for Earspasm and you'll, you'll pull up the channel. Also, earspasm.com. Lots of great information, um, even some free arrangements and sheet music there. Um, good resources for players of bass clarinet and regular clarinet and all in between. So um, we have a couple really great sessions coming up at... Uh, what time is it? At two o'clock um, with the new music committee on extended techniques and also the composer and performer collaborative process at three o'clock. So I hope you'll join you join us for that. And again, thank you all so much for being here. And thank you to Mike and thank you to Jenny for leading the discussion. And we will see you all in just a little while. Okay. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys.